Hi, and welcome to tonight's debate hosted by The Preacher Feature. I'm David Eastland, and we here at The Preacher Feature are so glad that you have decided to take time to listen to two men discuss opposing views regarding the salvation of man. Our participants tonight will be Tanner Dykin and Todd Clifford. Tanner is the pastor of the Open Door Baptist Church in Mayfield, Kentucky, and is a student with Boyce College. He has held public classes in systematic and biblical biblical theology. He has special interest in such theological topics as the canon, the covenants, and the atonement. He is the author of the counseling booklet, Hope for the Gender Confused, which is available for free on archive.org. Todd is a nat native of Dexter, Missouri. He is a 1988 graduate of Freed Hardeman with a BS in agricultural business. He is married to the former Rhonda Bridges of St. Louis. They have two children and they have one grandchild. He has served as the preacher for the Burleson Church of Christ in Hamilton, Alabama since February of 1996. Prior to this, he served churches in Missouri, Arizona, and Tennessee. In pre-debate conversations, Todd and Tanner have agreed that they will address each other simply by their first names. They intend to be kind, considerate, and compassionate in manner, but unflinching in clearly presenting the truth. There will be a total of four presentations tonight. Tanner Dykin will be leading off by making a case for the following proposition. The Bible affirms that man is justified at the point of faith, holy by God and without any contribution of works on man's part. Todd Clifford will then be, will be tasked with denying that proposition. Tanner will return to affirm the same proposition and then Todd will return to deny. We do welcome comments during the discussion, and we do ask that you share and like this broadcast. This enables many more people to have access tonight to this discussion. With that, we turn it over to Tanner Dykin to make his arguments for the following proposition. The Bible affirms that man is justified at the point of faith, holy by God, and without any contribution of works on man's part. Take it away, Tanner. All right. Well, I'm Dykin, a pastor at Open Door Baptist Church. Uh, tonight, I'll be taking uh, the affirmative on our proposition. The Bible affirms that man is justified at the point of faith, holy by God, and without any contribution of works on man's part. I'd just like to uh, start uh, tonight by uh, thanking those who are putting this on, uh, just like uh, the uh, Preacher Future page. And I'd like to thank my uh, debate opponent, uh, uh, Todd Clippert, and uh, just thank him for uh, a great exchange tonight. Uh, I have uh, three contentions, the same three contentions that uh, I had in my last debate, uh, to show that uh, man is justified uh, wholly by God at the point of faith, apart from any contribution of works that we might bring to the table. And so with that, uh, we'll just begin with uh, my first contention, purposes of God, the sovereign purposes of God, uh, imply that we are justified by faith alone. Uh, because the work of salvation is all of God, that it flows out from his activity toward mankind. Therefore, his work is perfect. His work does not need any contribution from us in order to be complete. Uh, Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And those whom he called, them he also justified. And them whom he justified, uh, them he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Uh, we cannot read this passage without hearing uh, the sovereign work of God in it. That when a person is justified, it is because God has justified them. 
he has worked. Uh, it, it says in uh, verse 29, whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate, uh, he did call, he did justify, and he also glorified. Uh, this is the work of God that he does. Uh, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God justifieth. God justifies. Uh, the only part that we have is to trust that God justifies. We rest in his power to justify us, and we cannot bring anything to his work because his work is perfect from the beginning. In Romans 9, verse 15, we also read, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. It's not uh, according of anyone. It's not according to the effort, the running of anyone. It's according to God showing mercy towards who he wills. And so, uh, since justification is a sovereign work of God, uh, it is not according to any contribution that we make to it. But all we do is trust that God justifies, and he does so perfectly. Uh, second, uh, the fact that humanity is depraved, that uh, we uh, cannot do that which is pleasing to God, means that God must sovereignly justify us. He must do the work of conversion in us, and we cannot bring anything to the table to, uh, uh, to uh, 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 initiate justification for uh, ourselves. Uh, John 8 verse 34 says, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, sin is the servant of sin. And in verse 44, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. Uh, Jesus' understanding of the sinfulness of man uh, was not a soft understanding. Uh, it was an understanding that mankind is enslaved to sin. That we are the servants of sin. That we are of our father the devil, and the lusts of our father we will do. Uh, and if, if uh, uh, there were anything at all that we could do to, to get justification for ourselves, uh, even then we, we would not be able to do it. We would be slaves to our sin. We would be unable to do what is pleasing to God. Uh, Ephesians 2 verse 1 uh, likewise gives us a, a very grim diagnosis of humanity. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. For in time past, ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lusts of our own flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. Uh, we were dead in our sin. A, a dead man uh, cannot do anything. He, he cannot, uh, in this sense, in the spiritual sense of deadness, uh, we cannot do anything uh, spiritually to get ourselves out of our spiritual deadness. Uh, we were walking according to the course of this world. We were friends of Satan, and we did what he wanted to. We were by nature children of wrath, even as others. It was, it was in our very nature that we were children of wrath. Romans 7, ver, uh, 8, verse 7 says, Because the enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If anything is pleasing to God, if uh, the, uh, any uh, supposed works to bring about our justification are pleasing to God, the scripture says we could not do it. We were the enemies of God, and we loved to be the enemies of God. Uh, this is what mankind is before uh, God comes and works in them. And so because of this, we have to recognize that the script, that the first work in salvation is God bringing a person to spiritual life, uh, causing them to look to Jesus Christ in faith. And this is why it's all of grace.
Ephesians 2 verse 4, picking up where we left off there. It says, but God, remember, this is the work that God does, that God justifies, who is rich in mercy for his great love for with he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness through Christ Jesus. The first work that's mentioned here that is done by anybody uh, after it speaks about our deadness in sin is that God works according to his own mercy, according to his own love. And that work is that he brings to spiritual life. Uh, and so he sets us with Christ. Verse 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The grace of faith, the grace of God that he gives to us faith, uh, is not of ourselves. Uh, it, it doesn't come from us. It is his gift to us that he has graciously raised us up spiritual life and caused us to live his son in faith. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Uh, God brings to God is to look to his son in faith, and it's not in verse 8. The same works that it says that we are not saved by are, this, are the mentioned in the very next verse as the works which God has ordained for us to walk in. Uh, if God us to, to, to walk in any works, to do any works, then those works are not the occasion of our being saved, as, as it says in the passage. First uh, John 5 verse 1 says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And in this sense, uh, in the, the, the uh, grammar of the text, uh, the uh, belief in Jesus Christ is caused by being born of God. Uh, a person believes because they are born of God. In verse 4, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Uh, notice the um, the order of events here. Whatsoever is born of God, we are born of God first. That is what overcomes the world. And this is what it means to overcome the world to have faith in Jesus Christ. We are born of God first, and that is what causes us to look to the Son in faith and uh, receive God's goodness to ourselves. Uh, we could also look at uh, John 1, verse 12. As many as received him, then gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God not born of natural birth, not born of the will of our flesh or of our uh, own choosing, but of God, that he births us again. And so we see the nature of uh, the, the um, uh, depravity of man in his fallen state and the fact that God regenerates first shows us that Justification is not according to our works. God works first, and he is the one that justifies based on the grace that he gives to us in giving us faith in Jesus Christ. And so there we have uh, the uh, biblical witness about that. Uh, my final argument tonight uh, is that the nature of imputed righteousness implies that we are saved by faith alone. Uh, since it is only Christ's righteousness, since that is the only thing that will be counted uh, in our favor on the last day, uh, since that's it, therefore we cannot contribute to it by our own doings. Uh, if I have to do something uh, in order to, in, in some sense, uh, complete the work of God in Jesus Christ, uh, 
uh, to, to, to get at the righteousness of Christ, well then that work is uh, counted to me as part of my it's, it's a reason of, of boasting that I had to complete the work of Christ that he did. And so uh, we see in uh, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 that he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made righteousness of God in him. It is God's righteousness, Christ's righteousness, not our own righteousness. Uh, if we do something in order to get that righteousness, then in a sense we're adding to it. We, we have to, maybe we only have to do one work. Maybe to contribute one thing to Christ's righteousness. Nonetheless, we have contributed something to it. And it's not fully his righteousness that we're justified by. We are also then justified by something that we have done. It is partly our own righteousness. In Isaiah 53, verse 11, he shall see the travail of his soul and he'll be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Christ justifies it is in, in his part of justification, his righteousness is the only thing that's imputed to us for our righteousness. But again, if it's some work that we have to contribute, then uh, it's not wholly his righteousness. In Romans 4, verse 1, we also see an explicit statement that it is not by works that we are justified. What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. When Abraham was justified, he didn't labor for his justification. Uh, it says that he uh, did not do uh, anything. He, he, he simply believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Uh, the word works here is simply being used in a generic way that is putting forth any effort. Uh, there was no law in the day of Abraham that he would be uh, justified by. Uh, the, the works that are referenced here are those works that surely Abraham did do, surely that he obeyed God in certain ways, but those were not the occasion of his being justified, because if it were, he would have a, a reason to glory, but it's not that way before God. Remember, it is God that justifies. It is by his own will that he begets us. It is uh, uh, for his own mercy and love towards us that he quickens us together with Christ. And so the conclusion is made in verse 4, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. To him that does not put forth uh, effort, to him that does not try to contribute to the righteousness of Christ, to him that only trusts in God who justifies, will justify, his faith is counted for righteousness. It, he is uh, justified by God at that occasion. And so we see throughout the scripture uh, that it's, it's not according to what we do. It's not according to our working. Uh, any works that might be put forward to, uh, to say that we, we must do this in order to be counted righteous before God, uh, those works are denied by Scripture uh, as being the occasion of our uh, being justified. Uh, is it a work that God has ordained? Then it is not the occasion of our salvation. Is it a work by which we obey God? Then it says to him that worketh not, believeth, his faith is counted for righteousness. Uh, is it in that we might uh, think that we do this thing 
and it puts God in a position where he must justify us, then it says it's a reason for boasting, a reason for debt, and God will not have this. And so throughout the scripture, we see the consistent testimony that God justifies and that he does so according to own mercy towards us and not in with reference to our works, but to the righteousness of Christ. Uh, one more thing that I'd like to note, as this is liable to come up uh, in the debate later, is in Matthew 3, verse 15, uh, Jesus at his baptism said that it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. That is, b- between him and uh, John the Baptist, that his baptism was for himself to fulfill all righteousness. Now, if Christ fulfills righteousness on our behalf, then he fulfilled the righteousness, which is a baptism on our behalf. Uh, The same word is used in Matthew 5, verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill, to fulfill the righteousness, which is of the law. Uh, Jesus, when he came to John the Baptist, knew that he needed to be baptized in order to be ordained as a priest, in order for him to uh, be fully obedient to the Old Testament law. And so he submitted to baptism. And so that baptism was cre- was his, by nature, his righteousness, his obedience to God. And the scripture says that it is this righteousness that is credited to you and me at the occasion of faith in Jesus Christ. We must come by faith that Jesus Christ fulfills the on our behalf. And so with that, uh, my time is drawing short. Uh, I forgot to mention this at, at the beginning of my uh, statement, uh, but uh, you're likely not seeing me in video uh, on the uh, live presentation here. That's because we had a, a, a few technical issues. Uh, I'll not be appearing in uh, that way before you tonight, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, I'll have a local recording of this up uh, later on if anyone wants to uh, look at my uh, beautiful face. Uh, and uh, so with that, uh, that's what I have for uh, uh, my opening statement tonight. Uh, I look forward to hearing what Todd has to say and uh, having some interaction with him later tonight and tomorrow. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'll turn it right back over to uh, uh, to our host tonight. The Church of Christ is, is not a denomination nor a non-denomination. We're a part of trying to restore what we find originally in the scriptures. Before denominations existed, the Lord had set up his own church and we are striving to be that same church that we read in the scriptures. All right, Ben says that I'm live. All right, welcome to our debate tonight. Let me first of all uh, thank, um, I want to thank uh, Ben and David for inviting me to this, be a part of this debate. And uh, I want to wish Dave, uh, Ben a happy birthday today. I want to thank Tanner for agreeing to participate. Uh, he and I have been in continuous discussion from the outset. I found him to be quite accommodating, very friendly, possessing a kind spirit. And I believe that came through in uh, his first affirmative. And I'd also like to thank uh, three brethren that's helped me immensely, uh, uh, Brother Bill Burke, uh, Tyler Young, and uh, Brother Clint Brown, uh, all three Texas preachers. And I As I told him, I said, I hope folks don't believe that or think that we've gathered together at the Alamo when I'm finished. Uh, The proposition that has been affirmed by Tanner is simply that God does absolutely everything in the saving of the souls of men, even apart from man's own will or desire uh, to be saved. In fact, that a man cannot even have the will or desire to be saved until God saves him, that God does absolutely everything everything and uh, and so um, but let me just before uh, i continue with a, a illustration slide let me just make a point that there is there is 
a giant difference between adding something to what God does and God himself in his sovereignty requiring conditions upon which man receives his blessings. So I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Ben, if he would, to uh, bring up, let's see, slide, bring up slide number, well, the, the slide on um, numbers 21 and the fiery serpents. Numbers 21 and the fiery serpents. And I'll just assume that that is up. You would, you go ahead and turn to uh, Numbers chapter 21. And we see in this particular text that, uh, that uh, the people of God have grumbled against uh, God and against Moses and have accused Moses of bringing them up in the wilderness to, uh, to be killed uh, in the wilderness. And in verse number seven through uh, verse number nine, we see that, that Moses uh, 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 prayed for the people and God uh, heard Moses' prayer and made provision uh, as these people, and I should have mentioned this just a moment ago, because of their grumbling and because of, of their complaining, God sent fiery serpents to bite the people in verse six, and many of them died. But when Moses made intercession for the people, there in chapter 21, verse seven, that God gave a law by, by the means of his grace, unmerited favor, God gave a law to Moses. And that law was make a, fire, a, a serpent of bronze and a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the serpent, he lived. Now, I want to just note some things and pull up the next slide in that number on fiery serpents, if you would, please, uh, Ben. And we want to ask some questions about, about these fiery serpents. And, and, the, uh, and, and the fact is, did they add anything to what God did? And the answer is no, they did not add to anything to the power of God. But the question is this, were they commanded to do anything in order to receive God's blessing with regard to these snake bites? You know, we ask the question, were these uh, uh, people saved by grace? In other words, were they delivered from these fire servants by the grace of God? And the answer is yes, true, they were. And then that those that were bitten by grace were saved apart from any works of obedience. That obviously is false. And that their obedience invalidates God's grace and sovereignty is also false. Now, by Moses making the serpent and the people looking at the serpent, they did nothing to add to the work and the power of God. And yet God made it a condition, a condition of deliverance, a condition of being saved from the, the fiery serpent bites. That, uh, and so, but their obedience, their faith, their obedience in no way invalidated God's grace. It did not impugn or in any way val invalidate God's sovereignty. In fact, their faith in what God told Moses to do and what they did was a testimony to their belief in the sovereignty of God. Now, we want to make one more uh, here with uh, the city of Jericho in Joshua chapter 6. And so, ask Ben if he'll bring up that first slide on Joshua and uh, the walls of Jericho, uh, probably a uh, slide about 140, if I'm not mistaken. And we see in Joshua chapter 6, the manifestation of God's grace as presented to Joshua and his people in the fall of Jericho. And in this particular case, we find that there is God's grace extended to Joshua and the people of God, where it says in verse two, I have given Jericho into your hand. In other words, God spoke of this as an accomplished fact. That was his gift. I'm giving this city to you. But Attached to the giving of that city was a law, and that law was that you march around the city six, one time a day for six days, 
blasting the trumpets, but keeping your mouths closed. And then in the, in the, on the seventh day, you march seven times, and when the signal is given, everyone was to shout. And so those were the conditions given to the extension of God's grace. And then in Joshua 6, 14 through 20, we see that Israel, by faith, obeyed meeting the commandments, the conditions that God had set forth. And then in verse 21, that they utterly destroyed everyone in the city. We see that this, that when they shouted in verse 20, the wall fell down flat. Now, the question, the question then is this. Did they add anything to make the walls fall down? Did marching around the walls create some type of shakiness and, and, and damage the foundation of the walls of Jericho? Well, no. Did, did blowing trumpets make those walls fall down? No. Did shouting make those walls fall down? No. But did those things have to be done in order for the walls of Jericho to fall? Now, let me direct your attention to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 30, where the Bible says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell. And what is our, what is our key word here? After. The walls of Jericho fell after they were encircled for seven days. And so we see that God attached the conditions of marching once a day for six days, blowing trumpets but remaining silent, the seven uh, circles on the seventh day, the blowing of the trumpets, the shouting, then the walls fell. In other words, God's grace was not administered, was not made a reality. Until the people, until the people of God obeyed the conditions that God set forth. Now, in slide 141, we ask again the same type of series of questions. Uh, did did the walls of Jericho fall by grace? Yes, they did. Did the walls of Jericho fall by grace without any works of obedience? That would be false. No, they did not. We ask the same question again to, uh, as we did in, with regard to Numbers 21. Did Israel obedience of faith invalidate God's grace and sovereignty? And the answer is absolutely not. Again, it expressed their faith in God's sovereignty and his right to attach conditions to receive his blessings. And so with the, the case of Numbers 21, and in the case of uh, Joshua chapter 6, I would ask Tanner, is it not correct to say that they added nothing to the power of God, but yet they were still required to obey God in order to receive his blessings? And so, and I think the answer to that question is abundantly clear that obedience was required in order for them in order for them uh, to receive the blessing of God. Now, let me move on as I know my time is getting away. Uh, Tanner made reference to John chapter eight and human depravity. Uh, he says that human depravity and the nature of regeneration implies sola fide or, or faith only. And then he went to John chapter eight and verse 34. Which, so if, uh, ben, if you'll uh, bring up slide 104, and then we'll uh, prepare to move to uh, 105 after that. But in slide 104, with regard to John chapter 8, uh, Tanner made reference to a couple of verses in this text. One of them was in uh, verse 34, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And then later down in verse 44, he said, You are of your father, the devil. And his desires you want to do. Now, now Tanner took these two verses and used them to try to teach the doctrine of total depravity, total inability uh, to, to believe in God or respond to God uh, in any positive or favorable way. But Tanner needs to go back in the text, back to verse number 30. These people of whom Jesus said just simply made a statement, you are of your father earth, that whoever commits sin is the slave of sin, 
and you are of your father the devil. What does the what does the inspired record say of these people? In John 8 and verse 30, it says, Then Jesus said to those Jews, that's verse 31, excuse me, verse 30. He spoke these words, many believed in him. Then verse 31, Jesus spoke or said to those Jews who believed in him. And then in verse 33, they answered him. So the group of people that are under consideration here in John 8 and 34 and John 8, 30, or John 8, 36, John 8, 44, are clearly spoken of twice in the immediate context as those who believed in Jesus. Now, in, in uh, uh, slide 105, please, as we move uh, from there, we ask this question with regard, uh, we ask this question with regard to uh, total depravity. Uh, did these or do these people, uh, 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 are they believers? Or are they totally depraved, as Tanner has affirmed? So John, the inspired writer, says these are people who believed in Jesus. And he said it twice. Now, are they totally depraved, or are they believers like the text says? So are they believers as the text says, or are they totally depraved as Tanner says? In this case, I will choose what the text says over what Tanner says. Uh, there's nothing in this verse that it, it even remotely implies uh, total depravity. In fact, there is not one text anywhere in the Bible that says that man is totally depraved. Now, I want to look at what Tanner said with regard to Ephesians chapter 2 in his defense of total depravity. And I want to go to slide 110. Because Tanner says that because we are dead in our sins and trespasses, we are totally unable to do anything in regard to our, our uh, spiritual condition. And so we ask with regard to Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, does this text teach total depravity? Does dead in sin and trespasses mean total inability? And, and so we would ask, well, what does the Bible say about the word dead? Uh, note, uh, for example, in... Uh, in uh, uh, slide uh, 110 here, does, does a dead mean total inability? Sleep is a euphemism for death in the New Testament. Jesus spoke of Lazarus uh, being asleep in John 11, 11. Uh, He said Lazarus was dead in John 11, 13. Paul used these two terms interchangeably uh, with regard to uh, 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 those that were asleep in Christ, and those who are dead in Christ, using the term sleep and dead interchangeably. Then in slide uh, 111, we find that Paul uses the terms interchangeably in 1 Corinthians 15, 50, uh, 50 and 51, 52, speaking of we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. He's talking about death there. And then in verse 52, he says the dead in Christ. And so he uses those terms interchangeably there with regard uh, to uh, total uh, uh, to uh, death and sleep. But in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 30, we find where in our next slide, slide, I believe 111 or 112, that, uh, that Paul spoke of those Christians who were weak and sick and many sleep. Now he's talking to Christians. He's talking to members of the church at Corinth. And he says, some of you are weak, some of you are sick, and many of you sleep. Now, uh, with uh, regard to go to our next slide, with regard to um, uh, these Christians, it says if they were weak and sick, then what is the state of those who were said to sleep? Now, if they were dead, as the text, or as Tanner would say, they're dead, they're totally unable to do anything, then could they respond as being asleep, being dead? Could they respond to Paul's correction and repent? Or must God make them alive through a direct and irresistible operation of the Holy Spirit? And just to, to drive this point home a little bit more, look at slide 113 with regard to what Paul says about young widows. He says, the young widow is said to be dead while she lives. 
Now, can that young widow repent of her sin? Or is she totally unable to repent of the sins that, that she has committed or is committing as uh, enumerated there in 1 Timothy 5? And then finally, we have a church in slide 114, a church that was spoken of as being alive, but they were dead. The church at Sardis, Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 2, uh, Jesus said to this church, you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. And we asked the question, could those folks in that church repent, or were they totally unable? Were they possessed with total inability because of their deadness. And so Tanner has, has taken this word dead in Ephesians chapter two, and he has stretched it way beyond the intent of the writer and way beyond the usage uh, that we find in the New Testament. And we wanna move on now uh, to uh, Tanner's statement. And uh, I believe just for the sake of time, uh, let uh, Ben know this will be the last, uh, we won't have any more slides uh, through the last four or five minutes of our discussion tonight, or at least in this opening section. But, uh, but uh, Tanner says that regeneration precedes any action on man's part. Now, the Bible says that we're saved by faith. But Tanner says that we, are, we have faith because we're saved. See, there, there's, a, there's a, words mean things. Now the Bible says that we are that we are saved by faith, or that we have salvation by faith and through faith. But Tanner says we have faith through salvation. Now, what does the Bible say about this matter of of uh, regeneration or being born again? In First Peter chapter one and verse twenty-two, uh, Peter writes to those brethren. He says, "Seeing then that you have purified your souls by obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love for the brethren." Love one another with pure heart fervently, being born again. That's a participial phrase, being born again. When were they born again? When they obeyed the truth through the Spirit. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 17, Paul says, But God be thanked that when you were the servants of sin, you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, being then made free from sin. When? When were they made free for sin? When they obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. And then being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. And so being made free from sin and being made the servants of righteousness comes after obedience to the doctrine of Christ and not before. And time does not permit us to get into John 3, 3 and 5 if we don't get into it uh, tonight. I'm sure that we'll discuss it tomorrow in our discussion of baptism, but uh, our time for this session is done. There'll be just a brief period of, of, of interlude as, or commercials as I get out of the chat room and we get Tanner back in. Let me thank you again for watching. Please stay with us and Tanner will be back in just a couple of minutes. Reach out to the families in your community for less than the cost of a postage stamp. That's what Mike did, an evangelist with the Church of Christ. Mike needed to get the word out to his neighbors that the New Testament church was right around the corner, but funds were tight. Direct mail made the most sense, but Mike didn't know how to use direct mail or to design an attractive mailer until he found house to house, heart to heart. HTH is the largest publication among churches of Christ. House to House has been used since 1995 by thousands of congregations to teach the gospel, promote local events, and invite visitors from the community. Each issue has eight pages of Bible articles, short stories, family instruction, and scripture-based quizzes to interest those looking for truth. Each issue includes God's plan of salvation and offers free materials to those seeking to learn the Bible. Mike was able to customize the front and back with information pertinent to his own congregation and community and he even got free tracts and bookmarks to hand out to visitors and while door knocking. Mike soon greeted several visitors from the community who came to services because they received HTH in the mail. He followed up with them and soon had several Bible studies going. The church grew and enjoyed a new enthusiasm not seen in years. So if you're like Mike, you too will find HTH a great tool for reaching out to your community 
and fulfilling the commission to go into all the world with the gospel. Matthew 28:19. Last time, I introduced the idea that most of us are gamblers in nothing but religion. That when we buy a house, we insist upon a title. When we deposit money in a bank, we insist upon a receipt. When we buy an automobile, we insist upon a title. When we buy hamburger meat, we insist that it be weighed. But in the most important matter of all, that is the salvation of our souls, many of us will accept the mere guess when they could be certain. No one will accept the mere guess of a butcher in a meat market that he is giving you actually five pounds of steak. You want him to weigh it, and you want to see it weighed. You want to be sure as you can. But yet, when it comes to the matter of religion, to the matter of being saved from sin, many people will accept the guess of somebody else, the mere estimate, and will not really check up and see for themselves. Remember in Acts chapter 17 and 11, the Bible ascribes nobility. In other words, this is saying this is what God wants everybody to do to the Bereans who search the Scriptures daily to see if the things that were taught by the Apostle Paul were actually in harmony with the Scriptures. All right. Uh, well, that was uh, that was some uh, good from uh, Todd there. Uh, I'll do my best to keep up with it. Uh, I'll just jump right into what he was saying. Uh, first, he he said that uh, what I was saying is that we are we are saved apart from our desires. That, that is, that we're saved apart from uh, desiring to, to to have faith to to, to have the salvation of God. Uh, I never said anything like that. Uh, my belief is that when God works in somebody, that is when their will is is uh, changed toward Christ. That He gives a person. A desire to be with Christ and have his salvation. If we look in 1 John 4 19, we love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. So there we have uh, that we love him because he first loved us, because he first had mercy towards us because he had love to us, therefore we love him. Uh, the passage continues in verse 1 of chapter 5, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begot of him. Remember what I said before about that passage, that grammatically the reason that we believe in Jesus Christ is because we are born of God. In verse 4, then, Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Just as I said at the beginning, we are born of God, and we overcome the world, and what it means to overcome the world is to have faith in Christ. We love him because he first loved us. And so uh, I just like that that was a short criticism that he gave, but I, I really wanted to, to get to that uh, right at the beginning. Uh, next, he used two examples from the Old Testament. He used Numbers 21 and the fiery serpents that were sent among the uh, camp of Israel and Joshua chapter 6 to, to try and show that because they, um, that the, the grace of God was, was, was given to them and therefore they, they did these things and they received a, uh, a good outcome from it. And I just like to, to to note very briefly on this that neither of these passages are talking about justification. Uh, they are types for uh, the New Testament, no doubt, and, and for how the people of God corporately ought to ought to relate to uh, to uh, Him. Uh, but they're not going to be in every single way in analogy to uh, the New Testament church and baptism. And so uh, I just wanted to, to say that very briefly. Um, and, uh, and so uh, there we go. Uh, in that criticism, he also said uh, that God is sovereign to, to give conditions for receiving his saving grace, to, to, to be justified. Uh, and I would just point us once again back to uh, Romans chapter 4. Uh, if uh, To him that worketh, 
Is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of death? But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Uh, the negation of works as a condition to enter into a saving relationship with Christ. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. He went to Romans 8 and, and how I used a couple of passages out of Romans 8 to, uh, to, to try and, uh, uh, well, negate what I, had, what I had brought out of the text there. And so uh, let's go that to uh, that uh, right at the moment. Uh, of course, in that passage, a year of the, your father, the devil, of the lust of the father, ye will do. Uh, whosoever sinneth is the servant of sin. Uh, he points us to uh, verses 30 and 31. As he spoke these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Uh, what we have here is Jesus stating the uh, condition of proof that they are genuine before the world. Uh, he does say, uh, if ye continue in my word, future tense, if you continue to believe, then he says, then are ye my disciples indeed, present tense. Uh, all that it says that they had done is believe, uh, and he says, present tense, if you continue, or future tense, if you continue in my, not my word, then now you are my disciples indeed. He's saying that if you continue, then we know that from the beginning you were my disciples, that, that from this moment when you professed faith, you were my disciples. Uh, another uh, note about this is that when it says that the, um, the Jews believed, uh, it's using the aorist tense there. Uh, and, and what it's, it's implying here, and it's often used this way, is that they had faith at a moment in time. They had a, a, a belief or a professed belief at a moment in time, but that that faith was not an abiding faith. It was, it was more like a fad that they were jumping on. And uh, they, uh, he says, if you can continue in faith, then you're my disciples. But if you do not, then it's evident that it was just you were jumping onto this bandwagon and uh, and you were not genuine about it. Nothing in here uh, uh, contradicts the idea that God works first in us, that God has to bring to spiritual life in order for us to have genuine faith in Christ. Uh, the next thing, that the place that Todd went was in Ephesians 2 when it says, uh, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And he, he takes this, uh, this, this word death, and he, he, he goes through the New Testament to show that oftentimes the word for death and the word sleep uh, are used interchangeably in a sort of metaphorical sense. And the implication he's trying to bring is that he's trying to draw that meaning into Ephesians chapter 2. And say that, uh, therefore, the, the word for death here uh, is not uh, necessarily meaning death, but it's, it's more like maybe inactivity. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what uh, exact meaning he was trying to bring into it. Inactivity, maybe, uh, maybe uh, unconsciousness or, or something like that. Um, the problem is that there's no contextual clues to tell us that Paul is using the text in this way are using the word in this way. The, the word is simply death, that they were dead, uh, just as a corpse is dead. And without a contextual clue to tell us that this is being used only in a metaphorical sense and not in a substantive sense, uh, it, it, it's unjustified, I think, to, to bring that into the text. I think we should let the text itself um, speak for itself. And anyway, uh, what we see that follows after death uh, here and, and, and uh, depravity is not that uh, they therefore did works or they therefore did something and God worked graciously toward them after. It says simply, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love for with he loved us, even when we were dead, that is still in that state, 
whatever we parse that out to mean, that state of disobedience, even when we were dead, he quickened us together with Christ uh, and, and forgave us. Uh, and so uh, I don't see how this, uh, you know, helps uh, at all. Um, next, he, he says that, uh, that the Bible, he, he said something like this, that the Bible says we are saved by faith. But Tanner says we are saved before we have faith. And uh, that's just not the case. Uh, an understanding of the ordo salutis, the order of salvation, will show us that faith is incorporated in salvation. It is a part of salvation. But what comes before faith and what is the cause of faith? As we read in Romans chapter 8, those whom he foreknew, them he also did predestinate. And those whom, uh, those he predestinated, them he also called. And those whom he called, them he also justified. At that point, we are justified by faith after predestination, uh, a foreknowledge, predestination, and calling. There we, uh, therefore, we are saved. Uh, finally, he went to a couple of passages that I, I hopefully will have time to uh, get to uh, uh, before my time runs out. Uh, he went to 1 Peter 1 and verse uh, 21, uh, or he went to uh, verse 22. And he was saying that be, that by uh, obedience, by uh, the implications by obedient works, in other set, in, in another way, that they they were justified, they were saved by obedient works. Uh, but if we back up to verse twenty one, the scripture says, "By him do believe in God." Uh, who by him do believe in God? Speaking of the believers, and that by Christ we believe in God. Again, it's the work of God that we believe in Christ in the first place, that raised him from the dead, up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the uh, Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now the question is, is this talking about justification here, that we purify our souls in obeying the truth? I'd first like to say that if it is about justification, uh, this is is not saying, that I, I see nowhere in here that works are required. All it says is that they obeyed the truth. And if that truth is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, then sure, they obeyed the truth at the working of God. And so they were purified. But I'm not so quick, I'm, I, I wouldn't be so quick to say that this is justification anyway. Uh, it simply says that they purified their souls. This could simply be sanctification. And I would say that it is because the goal of it is unto unfeigned love of the brethren. That is to love, to a deeper communion with the people of God. This is the entire Christian life uh, is continuing to grow in love for the church and the people of God and for, uh, of course, Christ himself. And so we see uh, here that there's no uh, contradiction with what I've been saying. Uh, next, and uh, finally here on my notes, he went to Romans chapter 6 and verse 17, which says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Uh, a couple of things, again, to note here is, is this uh, uh, speaking again about justification? Is it explicitly talking about uh, justification? And I, I wouldn't say that it is. Uh, later on, it says that uh, we uh, yield your members servants of righteousness unto holiness at the end of 19. Again, continuing to become become more holy in Jesus Christ. Uh, but another thing is that he, he made a point on the beginning of verse 18, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness, saying that uh, essentially uh, if, um, uh, essentially that, that, that they obeyed from the heart uh, and because they obeyed from the heart, they were made free. Uh, and uh, that, that's 
not necessarily what the text is saying at all. Uh, the word there uh, can simply mean uh, that they were also made free from sin, that, that in addition to obey, obeying from the heart, they were made free from sin. Uh, it's not necessarily a causative relationship here that's being described. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I would just say that, um, first off, it's not necessarily about justification. This could simply be about how we continue to yield ourselves over the Christian life to Christ, and we are continually made free from those sins which so easily beset us. And uh, even if it were about justification, uh, then this could simply were also made free from sin, not that they obeyed and thus they were made free from sin. And, and so uh, that taken along with all that we've seen so far about justification by faith alone, that God is the one justifying, that it is Christ's righteousness that we are uh, imputed with, uh, that we could not do obedience to God uh, in the first place, uh, this in sin, because of our enmity against God. Uh, therefore, I think that uh, we are justified in just saying that uh, this is not uh, about uh, justification. This is this is about sanctification, uh, and we need to follow. Once again, I'll just I'll just point everyone before I end off here. Uh, we need to make sure that our reading of Romans is consistent with the argument that's being made by the author. A uh, chapter four has already happened in Romans. It's already established the way by which we are justified. And I'll just read once again in Romans four verse four. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of death. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And there we have that it's not according to works. It's not according to what we do. To him that believeth on the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And so with that, uh, I'll just turn it back over to our host. And uh, thank you all. How fast can you run? If you're like me, it's not as fast as you used to. Did you know that the fastest man alive can run almost 30 miles per hour? Astounding as that might sound, there's one thing that neither he nor we will ever be able to outrun. Our past will always catch up with us. That's what the Bible says. Take note, be sure, your sin will find you. Oh, and when it does, it can bring some of the darkest feelings. Remorse, regret, bitterness, hatred, guilt. The past can be brutal. But thanks be unto God, we don't have to feel that way. And that's what our new book's all about. It's called Forgiven, Forgiving, and Free. The Peace of Living Without a Past. Four brief chapters can help us literally break through those awful feelings of yesterday. Four chapters can help us come to know the grace that God offers us and the gracious spirit that, well, we should be offering each other. Four chapters. Forgiven by God, forgiving myself, forgiving others, forgiving God. It's a short, simple read, but one that can help us change the way we think about ourselves, each other, and even God. So I hope you'll find it very helpful, if not life-changing. Forgiven, forgiving, and free. The peace of living without a past. All right, we are back. Apologize, we had just a little technical difficulties, but uh, Ben's got everything worked out. We're thankful for that. Uh, let me just respond to some of the things that Tanner had to say in his second affirmative. Uh, he said that I said, he said, I he said, I said, he said that we are saved without any desire on our part. He says he never said that, but he necessarily implied it. When he said God does it all, Either God does it all or God doesn't do anything. 
And so if we have to bring a desire to it, then we have to do something. Moreover, Tanner has repeatedly said that we don't and cannot do anything. And yet at the same time, later on, we'll say we have to trust in God. And so it, it can't be it can't be all God, but we have to trust in him or it can't be all God, but we have to have a desire. He says God gives us the desire. Then it's all of God. There, there's no other there's no other reasonable conclusion to draw. You can't have it all God, but you have to trust in him. But if you do trust in him, it's because God told you, made you trust in him. And so. Uh, and so if God has to cause the desire, then it's still all it's still all of God and man doesn't do anything. So therefore, it's inconsistent for Tanner to even say that we have to trust in God or have a desire to be saved. Uh, I want to go back to I want to go back to the text uh, with a with respect to Romans 10. I meant not Romans 10, it's going to be Romans 6 and verse 17. Even even if the word also could be used, which I don't know any translation that uses the word also instead of the word then. All the translation being then made free from sin. All right. I'll grant it. Let's just say it is also being also made free from sin. You became servants of righteousness. It's still time stamped to obeying from the heart that form of doctrine. Now. What is the form of doctrine that was obeyed from the heart that brought to these individuals the remission of their sins? And Paul answers that question in Romans chapter six and beginning in verse number one. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Or how shall we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now catch this. Or know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. That's exactly what Paul's talking about. They were no longer the slaves of sin there in verse 17 and 18. When did they cease to become the slaves of sin? When they obeyed from the heart, the doctrine delivered to them. What was the doctrine that was delivered to them? the doctrine of being buried with Christ in baptism. Tanner has to answer this question. When is a man raised in newness of life? When is he raised in newness of life? And Paul says that the newness of life comes only after we are baptized, buried with Christ in baptism. Second question Tanner would have to answer from this text what does it mean to be planted together in the likeness of his death? And the, the obvious answer is that is a reference to being baptized. And note that it is a condition. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, if we have been baptized, then we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So Romans chapter six and verse 17, then or also makes no difference whatsoever. That, uh, that, uh, that one obeys from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered to them, being then made free from sin. They became the servants of righteousness. And Paul said that doctrine, that form of doctrine, that obedience is being buried with Christ in baptism. And so that's when newness of life takes place. That's when being in the likeness of his resurrection uh, becomes uh, becomes a reality, and so Romans chapter six seventeen uh, in no way in no way helps uh, Tanner's argument uh, with regard to uh, faith only. Uh, Tanner said I was using these Old Testament examples as the administration of God's grace, and and he said, but it doesn't have anything to do with justification. But both uh, both of uh, of these examples are given to us to show the pattern of God's grace and the appropriation of God's grace. And in fact, the account 
of Jericho in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30 is given in a lengthy discussion of what it means to be saved by faith. By faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice uh, than Cain. Uh, by faith, Noah, being warned of things not yet come, built an ark to the saving of his household. Over and over again through Hebrews chapter 11, we see that the pattern of salvation, the pattern of the administration of God's grace is faithful obedience to the commands of God. Abel obeyed God. Abel was blessed by God. Noah obeyed God. Noah was blessed by God. Abraham obeyed God. Abraham was blessed by God. Israel obeyed God. And Israel was blessed by God in Hebrews 11, verse 30. The entirety of Hebrews chapter 11 speaks of how people are saved by faith. And they're saved by faith when they obey what God says. At going to Ephesians 2, uh, my point is, is that Tanner makes too much out of the word dead. Uh, the, same, the same person who wrote it in wrote Ephesians 2, wrote 1 Corinthians 11. He didn't, he did not address what it meant to be. A dead or asleep and with regard to those in the church in, in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. He didn't mention what it meant to be dead while you're living. And, and Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, 1 Timothy 5 and, and verse 6. And so, and so my point is, is that Tanner's making too much of the word dead. Obviously, they weren't literally dead. They were dead in sins. But that doesn't imply in any way total inability. Again, not one verse in anywhere in the Bible uh, teaches the idea of total depravity. And then uh, finally, Tanner repeatedly says that regeneration precedes faith. And he, he goes to he goes to first uh, John five and verse four. This is the victory or this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. But he also made note of John chapter one. And verse 12, and I just don't think he's reading it very closely. It says, to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on his name. So no, those who received him are the same as those who believed on his name but they are still those who are given the right to become future. Tanner says they're born at the point of faith. John says, again, Tanner's at, Tanner is at odds with John. Tanner says that, that saved first, regenerated first, faith second. John 1.12 says faith first, authority or power to become sons of God second. And I'll go, I'm going to go back to John chapter 8. They believed in him. This, this, this quibble over the idea of the heiress, it's an heiress active. It means it's ongoing right now. This, I, I don't know where he got his bandwagon statement. I, I have no idea. The text says they believed in him. Tanner says you can't believe in Jesus without being regenerated. Now, the text says they believed in him. Were they regenerated or were they not regenerated, according to what Tanner teaches? And so, again, John 8 doesn't have anything to do with total inability. It doesn't have anything to do uh, with total depravity. And, and that text uh, that text still says uh, what it says. In John 12, in verse 42, it says, many of the, many of the scribes, the, uh, the Jew, Jewish leaders, believed in Jesus, but they would not confess him for fear of the Pharisees, lest they should be put out of synagogue, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. They believed in Jesus, John chapter 12 but they would not confess him. Were they regenerated? Were they saved? We're not gonna, we're not gonna quibble about a bandwagon. What does the text say? It says they were believers in Jesus. John 8, they were believers in Jesus. John 12, they were believers in Jesus. Moreover, the Bible teaches us that it is given to create faith. In John chapter 20 and verse number 30 and 31, and truly many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. Again, nothing about regeneration preceding faith there, that this Bible, this New Testament, the gospel of John given to us so that we might believe 
that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing we should have life in his name. I'm going to go back to 1 Peter in the time that I have left, and I know my time is short. The text still says that when we obey from the heart, that when we obey, that we are born again, that the, the new birth takes place when we obey. We have obeyed uh, 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 in verse 22. Thus, we've been born again, verse 23. And so, and so again, the text says, the text says what it says. Romans 6 is, is in, is in harmony. Uh, Romans 6 is in harmony with, uh, uh, with 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. And so, uh, and so those texts teach, they, they, they teach exactly uh, what they say, that we are born again. Uh, we are remitted of our sins. Tanner says that Romans 6, 17 doesn't have anything to do with justification but it has to do with the remission of sins, being made free from sin. Is there is there some difference in being justified and being free? From, can you be justified without being free from sin? Can you be free from sin without being justified? The text says being then made free from sin. And it's a reference back to uh, chapter six and particularly verses three through six, that we are made alive together with Christ when we are baptized, Ephesians 2 says that we are made alive together with Christ and when we are raised up. And so uh, with that, I will close this session. We'll have probably just a couple of minutes in between. And uh, and so I encourage you to, to stay around. Tanner will have a five minute uh, closing statement. And then after his closing statement, I'll have five minutes. So please, please stay tuned. We'll be finished up here shortly. If I were to ask you how many churches exist in the world today, what would you say? You might say, I don't know, a, a lot, I guess. And you would certainly be correct with that answer. There are over 43,000 churches that exist in the world today. Now I want you to think about how confusing that could be for a person who is seeking for the truth. Friend, may I respectfully tell you that God is not the author of confusion. If you open your Bible, you won't find 43,000 churches you'll only find one. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock I will build my church. Dear friend, our invitation to you is this. Let's go back to the Bible and be what they were, Christians only and a part of the one church that Jesus promised to build. All right. Uh, well, uh, that was uh, another good uh, round of interaction uh, from Todd. And uh, we'll just uh, go ahead and uh, once again, just jump uh, right into it. I'd just like to address a couple of things that he said uh, here in closing statement. Um, first, he, he that I uh, believe that God gives desire, that I believe God gives faith, and that I believe that it's all of God. And Yes, that, that's, that's absolutely true. It is God that justifieth. We love him because he first loved us. Uh, it is God. Uh, the Old Testament says that, that I am God, a, a just God, and a Savior. Uh, he is the only Savior. And so, yes, I, I do believe that. Um, uh, he went to uh, Romans uh, 6, 17 to 18, and, and uh, uh, essentially uh, just, uh, by uh, saying that uh, the the... Um, being made free from sin is still time stamped, even if even if we take the the word uh, in that way. Uh, and I don't see uh, how it is that he gets that. Uh, of course, it's, it's in the same context. We can say that, but I don't see that there was any real justification given for uh, for it is indeed uh, that way. Uh, and there was something that I, I also wanted to. Uh, to uh, really get to here. He, he went to Romans 6, uh, 1 through 5, and we'll be talking about this tomorrow, but I'll just note that in verse uh, 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 5, we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. We shall also be in the likeness, 
course those are implied words, of his resurrection. The, the, the point is that this is figurative language. We have been buried in the likeness of, in, in the symbol of his death, and so we should also be, and we will also be, in the likeness of his resurrection if we have faith in Jesus Christ. And that's, that's, absolutely, that's uh, absolutely fine. But this does not attribute justification to uh, baptism. Uh, he says that uh, I make too much of the word death in Ephesians 2. Uh, I think he makes too little of the word death. Uh, he talks about John uh, 1 verse uh, 12, uh, and uh, how it says that the, uh, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, to believe on his name, who were born not of blood. Um, the the uh, distinction that needs is that adoption is not the same thing as regeneration. God will not adopt a dead person. He has to bring them to spiritual life first. We get this in the, uh, uh, I believe it's in the book of Ezekiel uh, or, or Jeremiah, where, where Israel is likened to a infant that's stillborn. And uh, that it says, God said to the child, live. And the child lived and grew up. And then it was that God adopted them. And so uh, in the scripture, we need to maintain that distinction. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. He adopted them. They were born, regenerated, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God regenerated. Uh, he mentioned uh, John 8, and uh, I'll just uh, skip over that. I think that I... I made uh, enough of a point last time, and I'm running out of time. Uh, but he then went to John 20 and uh, verse thing that uh, I, I want to hit on right here at the last. Uh, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Of course, the scripture, the going out of the word of God, is what brings spiritual life uh, to the dead. Uh, we know that uh, the uh, regenerating work of God is likened to the creative act of God. And we know that that was done by the word of the Lord. Uh, in if, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, we see that uh, by faith, uh, we, believe, we understand that the worlds were formed. Uh, created by the word of the Lord. Uh, the uh, word of God goes out and creates spiritual life. And when he says, come forth, it comes forth. And uh, so with that, uh, I, I think that that's enough to say that, yes, that this is the work of God, uh, that God brings to life. It's demonstrated by the fact that the words go out to bring life, and they will not return to him void. So with that, uh, that's all I'll say at the moment. My time is uh, up, and so I'll just uh, quickly thank uh, those again who put this on. I thank Todd. I look forward to uh, interacting with him more tomorrow. And uh, so with that, I'll just uh, turn it back over to our moderator. Approximately 11 million people were killed during the Holocaust. Casualties included 6 million Jews and 1.1 million babies. Since 1973, our country has witnessed the silent Holocaust with over 61 million innocent babies being aborted in America. Thomas said that every precious child has been fearfully and wonderfully made. It's past time to wake up and choose life, America. I did not get to hear anything that Tanner said in his uh, final remarks, and so. Um, so I do have some notes that I made. And, uh, and so just as we uh, draw this evening to a close, uh, not having any idea, uh, not having any idea what uh, what uh, he said uh, from the outset uh, of his concluding remarks, uh, my notes are simply these, uh, that, that Tanner has not shown uh, that sovereignty or that God's sovereignty uh, negates um, divine conditions to be attached uh, to God's blessings. Uh, Tanner has not shown that man is totally depraved, 
and totally unable to respond uh, to God's offer to salvation. And Tanner has not shown that compliance with divine conditions adds to God's saving work. In fact, uh, and my con my uh, contention has been that compliance with conditions is not a contribution to God's saving work. Looking at the brass serpent did not add to God's saving work. Uh, walking around the wall of Jericho did not add to God's saving work. And uh, obeying God and obeying the gospel, as we noted from Romans chapter 6, does not add to God's saving work. Um, we talked about not bringing in any new material, so I'll simply uh, close with this particular illustration that uh, should something terrible happen and my folks, uh, uh, who I hope are watching tonight, if something were to happen to them and they were to be killed, uh, if during the, the process of going through probate, if I found out that they had left me a million dollars and thus through the estate, I receive a check from my parents' estate for a million dollars. Does endorsing a check do anything to add to that inheritance, or or does it does it mean I earned it? If I if I if I sign the back of the check, or I as I as we can do now, if I take a picture with my phone of this million dollar check, have I added anything to the power of the check to the value? of the check? Have I added anything to my inheritance? And the answer to that question is absolutely not. The million dollars still came entirely, entirely from my parents and their estate. And I simply endorsed a check or took a photo of it to deposit it in the bank. And those are the conditions that are attached to receiving a check to administering or making the, the power behind the check a reality. And so and so it, so it is with obedience to the commands of God, that God has provided for us an inheritance. And in that inheritance, he has attached conditions, conditions of obedience. And my compliance with those conditions does not place God in my debt. It does not add anything to the saving work of God. But God in his sovereignty has the right to attach those conditions to his blessings. And my adherence thereto in no way adds to the work that God does. And so uh, with that, I will close. I want to thank everyone for watching tonight. Again, I want to thank uh, Ben. I know things got pretty uh, sticky with him and the technology. I also want to thank Tanner uh, for his participation tonight. And I look forward to our discussion tomorrow night where I will be in the affirmative discussing the matter of the necessity of baptism to receive the remission of sins. And so, again, thanks to everyone for watching. Thanks to all who commented. And uh, with that, I will turn it back over to. Hey, everyone, uh, to reiterate what Todd said, thank you so much for tuning in being a part of this broadcast tonight. Uh, if you don't mind, I know there's now two videos for, for tonight's debate. If you don't mind liking and sharing both of them, uh, that will get these videos out to people that uh, we can't reach because they're not following us. But if you share it, it'll show up and we can reach a lot more people and, and uh, peak interest in these these wonderful things that we're talking about. I want to thank Todd and Tanner and invite all of you back tomorrow night to, to engage in night number two of this debate. Thank you so much. Have a great night.